Welcome to my kind of mom haul. Get ready, get set, get pregnant. All about making a baby beyond the obvious. Sure, conception can sneak up on you. It did on me the first time. Oops. But sometimes it takes a little effort, even a little planning and prepping, and sometimes more. Not to worry, because I am here with a woman who has personally helped get thousands of couples pregnant. And if that doesn't get your you, her handle will. The egg whisperer herself, Dr. Amy. And we're not even going to go with last names. I'm Heidi, you're Dr. Amy, and we're all good. Thanks for joining us today. Such a pleasure, Heidi. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so excited to talk to this amazing audience. Well, we have a great community. And of course, no surprise, they have lots of questions about making babies. They may be trying for the first time. Maybe they're adding to their growing families or hope to. Um, and guys, if you have any questions, please add them into the chat too. Um, but we're going to get started because we already got a lot of questions. We're going to start with the big O. Well, the other big O. <laughs> Population. It is a bit of a mystery to many women. It certainly was to me earlier in my life. So let's do a little demystifying really quickly. What is ovulation and what are some of the signs and symptoms that you might be ovulating? Yeah. So, I mean, ovulation is basically when an egg is released by a little fluid filled sac in the ovary called a follicle. So not to get into too much of the medical stuff, but it's basically your window of fertility. One way to know if you're ovulating is your body signs and symptoms. So if you're feeling a little, what's the word, um, horny, that's one word. If you're feeling a little frisky, if you're like, I'm wondering why I really want to have sex right now, that's something that happens as you get close to ovulation because your estrogen levels are rising. You might feel more lubricated. So that's the other sign where you see some of that egg white cervical mucus. And then you can also track ovulation. So there are many tests out there. One of the tests that I think is the most reliable, because there are a lot that you cannot trust, is called the PROVE, P-R-O-O-V test. And they have a confirm mm -hmm. and predict, or I should say a predict and confirm test, where you predict ovulation by a rise in a hormone that is secreted in your urine called LH, luteinizing hormone. This hormone peaks mm -hmm. right before ovulation. And then you can also confirm ovulation by another hormone metabolite of progesterone called PDG in the urine. They have a lot of great resources. So there are many different ways of tracking ovulation, your body signs or symptoms. And then you can also check with these at home tests by proof. And then you can also do something called basal body temperature tracking. I tell my patients to throw away their thermometer once they're working with me, but yeah. traditionally that's another way. I don't want people to obsess or you know, develop an obsession about tracking things like temperature when they really don't need to. And there's so many other ways of doing it. Especially the frisky part. That's the one I'm enjoying. I'm going yeah. with that. Yeah. The problem I think is when you're doing too much tracking and planning, I mean, sometimes it's necessary, but then you take a little bit out of the frisky, you know, aspect of it. And we, we want to have fun making a baby if at all possible, right? True. Making a baby is something that's coming from love of two people. You want it to be a spiritual exactly. and joyful journey. You don't want it to be stressful where, you know, there's a sex emergency or a boner emergency, <laughs> so to speak, you know? And I think when you make it that way, it causes a lot of friction with the couple. So yeah. I would say, try to put more joy and love into it and less stress and tension. Easier said than done. I mean, no one gets yeah. home to have their clothes ripped apart by their partners, you know, like in a telenovela, I wish, right? Wouldn't that be um, something, but doesn't work that way every yeah. time. Not every time, but we can, yeah. we can try for it for sure. Yeah, totally. When I, I was trying to get pregnant the second time and uh, I knew I was ovulating and poor Eric was sick as a dog. Yeah. He had a fever. He was all snotty and he rose to the occasion God bless them. We have why to show for it, but, but you don't have to go to those extremes. Try to yeah. have fun. Yeah, definitely. So, okay. So you release, um, the egg, but what about the sperm? Can they hang around and wait for a while? 
They actually can. The egg does not wait. The egg will sit in the fallopian tube for approximately 24 hours or less, but the sperm can actually sit with their tails or their heads, I should say. Their tails are tethered in the tube and they just sit and wait and wait for that egg. They can wait sometimes up to three. There are some reports of intercourse six days before ovulation yeah. and a pregnancy. So it's, it is possible to still get pregnant, even if intercourse was three to even six days before an ovulation. And what about after? So you're, you're saying it's about a 12 to 24 hour yeah, window? So, yeah. So once the egg is released, it'll sit in the fallopian tube for about 24 hours. Having sex after ovulation, you're just basically having sex for fun. Um, not for making a baby. So the likelihood of getting pregnant after ovulation. So there's a difference between after that surge, meaning the LH peak and after mm -hmm. ovulation, because once you see the peak, it doesn't mean you're ovulating. It means ovulation is going to come within 24, 36, sometimes even 48 hours. So I tell my patients to make sure to have sex even two days after the peak so that you're not missing mm -hmm. your window. Sex and lots of it. Yes. But fun sex. We're going to make it. Yeah. Fun. I mean, I think the more you're enjoying sex, the higher the probability you're actually going to get pregnant. And I know that's like, what are you talking about, Amy? Like, where, what study is that from? But we just know if people are enjoying sex, guess what? The sperm count's going to be higher. The sperm quality mm -hmm. is going to be better. I mean, if you put a guy in a public restroom with no locks on the doors and say, here, give me a sperm sample. He's going to be stressed out, nervous, and his sample is not going to be as good as if you give him the comfort of his home and say, now produce a sample. I mean, if you're comfortable and in the mood, we just know from that type of uh, research that the sperm is going to be better. So that's why I say it's really, um, really a good thing to try and enjoy each other as much as you can. I've got a lot of images in my head now that I'm going to have to shake, but yeah, well, you can also get pregnant in the uh, unlocked bathroom, that adds another element as well. So you absolutely, it's a different type of, oh, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get to the baby making lightning round. Um, yeah. Once a day, more than once a day is more better. Yeah. I mean, What's I tell patients, yeah, I tell patients every other day, starting about three days before ovulation or your peak, up until two days after, if you want to have sex more than once a day, go for it, but don't feel like you, you need to, because it's going to make your chances better. Um, I think some people can do that. Most people, if you told them to have sex two to three times a day, it would be a little bit stressful and quite frankly, impossible. But there are some people that like, that's their norm. I don't know yeah. many people that can relate to that, but there are some people who that's what they do and they can still do that and not worry that it's going to hurt their chances. So in other words, even, even if a guy is ha having, um, ejaculating more than once a day, it, it doesn't mean that his troops are going to be diminished. No. So, um, what we have learned is that the more frequent the ejaculation the lower the DNA fragmentation. So DNA fragmentation, bad. So low is good, high is bad. So frequent ejaculation actually can improve sperm quality. I mean, you get to the point where if you're ejaculating a lot, you know, the semen volume is going to be extremely low. But for a guy who has a good sperm count, if he ejaculates even twice a day, his count might be a little bit lower, but the sperm quality is still going to be really good. So it's like spitting a lot. When you spit a lot, eventually like you're going to have a dry mouth. So if you're doing it a lot, right. like, you know, maybe slow it down, but you're still going to have those cells in the saliva that are really good every time you spit. I, I'm not very good at analogies, but I think you know what I mean. <laughs> we don't know about the quality of the spit, but yeah. anyway. Yeah. Um, so, so, uh, but you're saying every other day is better than once a day? Or no, so I, a say day? Every, I say every other day for this reason alone, baby making is really hard. So if you actually give someone instructions that they have to have sex every day and they can't achieve that, it can cause distress, anxiety. It can cause people to fight with one another because one person is saying, I have to have sex today. And the other person might say, leave me alone. I feel like a piece of meat to you. Um, yes. my husband, my husband, 
anyways, I digress, but you know what I mean? So that's why I don't recommend daily because if you want to do daily, great. I don't know that there's necessarily a difference between daily versus every other day. There isn't. I mean, even having sex once or twice around a well-timed um, cycle, like your ovulation, we call that timed intercourse, doing that might be enough. You don't have to have sex five times around your ovulation cycle in order to get pregnant. But if you normally like to have sex every day, then just go for it. Go for it. Absolutely. It's not too much like hard work. Okay. So is there a better time of day? Yeah, I mean, yeah, there really is not what I tell patients, the better time of day is the time where you are feeling good and ready to have sex. Mm -hmm. So if I were to say the best time of day is 430 in the morning on Monday, 2am on Tuesday, patients would do that, because they want this so badly. But the reality is that's not the reality. So, you know, I just tell patients like, have sex when you feel like it. Don't put don't put that much, um, importance on the actual time of day or frequency just let it happen just do it let's do it so what about what about position i always say if you're in a position that's enjoyable for you then that's great what about you what do you think? exactly does it matter it, it really doesn't matter i mean I, I i i just make sure the penis is in the right hole Right. But basically like just so it's a good place to start. We can draw you guys a picture. Yeah. But as long as you're you have that down, um, it's really whatever you're gonna enjoy the most. Because it goes back to that same thing that I shared earlier, that the more you're enjoying sex, the better the sperm quality is going to be. So if a woman is not enjoying sex, it, this is obviously assuming a heterosexual relationship, then the man is going to sense that she's not enjoying it. It's not going to be as comfortable for him. It's going to be awkward. There's going to be stress and the semen quality may not be as good compared to if you are really enjoying each other during that moment. Yeah. Like let's get it on. Yeah. What about headstands? Do you need to do those headstands? If you even can do a headstand, do you need to elevate your hips? Do you yeah. need to stay in bed a certain amount of time? I mean, I, I mean, there's something called gravity. It is normal for semen to come out. Like I, I always ask my patients, like, why do you think this hasn't worked for you? And I, I would say probably like once a year, I have someone say it's because every time I move after sex, all his sperm falls out. And what I have to remind them is that it's the semen that's coming out. We want that to come out. Those sperm cells are quite fast swimmers and they're just sitting in your cervix and that cervical mucus, you know, one at a time being launched um, to the top of your uterus or launching themselves if they have the energy. So, you know, I don't think you need to you know, stand on your head or do some crazy yoga move, but what you could do if you wanted to is just put a pillow under your bum for 10 minutes, then go pee. You know, especially um, around ovulation time, if you have an increase in intercourse frequency, you might be at higher risk for a UTI, which is a urinary tract infection. So don't hold on to that sperm. Please get up, go pee, clean up so that um, you don't end up calling your doctor for uh, an antibiotic. No, that no. definitely does not improve the mood whatsoever. No, no. So you can go to the bathroom after sex. You're not going to pee them all out. You are not, you're not going to pee them out. You're not, mm -mm. no, the semen will come out. That's normal. We want it to come out. You don't want that trapped in the vagina for forever. We want the sperm, not the semen. That's right. Got it. So tell us about lubricants. Um, mm -hmm. Our goal of course is to be naturally lubricated, but if we're not, and we need a little lubricant to get ourselves in the mood and to get comfortable, um, is it true that some lubricants are sperm killers and is that true actually of saliva as well? Yeah. I mean, saliva isn't so bad, but there are some pro fertility marketed lubricants out there that actually kill sperm. So be really careful about what you're buying. And this is why I partnered with good, clean love. I don't know, if, not that, you know, this was meant to be a promotion for my lube, but there is a kit that you can get from my website or for good or from good, clean love. And it's the egg whisperer trying to conceive kit. And it does have a, one of the best sperm friendly lubricants 
out there that you can find. But some of the things that you can also use are right there in your kitchen cabinet or in your refrigerator. The egg, the white of an egg. I mean, not that anyone wants to crack an egg and then go have sex, but you can literally do that. The egg white is one of the best and most friendly uh, lubricants. And then you also have olive oil, canola oil, coconut oil. So these are things that many people have at home and you can use. And I did a live sperm show on YouTube. So if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you go watch it. What I did on this show is I took this poor guy's sperm and um, well, you did, uh, I don't know that the sperm really knew what they were you know, getting themselves into, but I took probably about 10 different lubricants and I tested the sperm on each one under a microscope and I projected it on a video screen. You can actually see what happens as each uh, sample touches the sperm. So that was fun for me to do and I hope you'll enjoy it too. I I, I think I will. <laughs> I guess we all have to run out and do that next. Um, so oral sex is fine. You don't have to worry about the, the spit killing sperm oh yeah no oral sex is fine okay. yeah what yeah. about underwater sex um in the pool in the hot tub in the shower in the bathtub yeah i mean so the thing with underwater sex you can still get pregnant with underwater sex but that would not be how i would recommend someone get pregnant if you're actively trying but I don't mm -hmm. want people to think who are trying not to get pregnant that they can't get pregnant. <laughs> that they're sex. safe. Yeah, <laughs> they're the safe. Cool. will seal up right after sex. It will keep the sperm in and you can still get pregnant. But the thing is underwater sex can get, put you at higher risk for vaginal and vulvar infections and irritation. You know, when you're in a hot tub or a spa or in a bath mm -hmm. or something like that, you know, there are chemicals in there that can be very irritating to the vagina. So I recommend to people who are trying to conceive is take it out of the hot tub, out of the bath, but um, out of a hot bath. But if you're in a shower, for example, you know, that would be fine. Okay. So let's do a little fertility fact checking. Um, are there foods that make you fertile or are there foods that make you less fertile? Yeah. I mean, I think um, foods that are healthy, um, not processed, You've heard of the Mediterranean diet. So that's one way of eating yeah. that has been shown to improve fertility. Foods that are ultra processed, basically junk food. So if you're living off of junk food, you can imagine that person may not be as fertile as someone who is eating a, basically eating the rainbow. So that's what I, I tell my patients. Look, you're going to be pregnant for nine months. I want you to take care of yourself before pregnancy in the same way that you envision yourself taking care of yourself in pregnancy. Treat yourself as well as you can, really baby yourself before you're carrying a baby. And and besides, you never know when you're gonna get pregnant. So you, you might don't. be taking my those precautions uh, for service. And by eating the rainbow, you don't mean Skittles, correct? I don't, not Skittles, no M&Ms or nerds. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So lots of brightly colored fruits and vegetables and Absolutely. healthy fats and those kinds of things. And by the way, you can get pregnant even if like, we don't want people to think that um, going to a fast food restaurant is a good birth control method. So you, you can right. still get pregnant, but you're Absolutely. improving your needs. Yeah. So I want people to be the healthiest version of themselves. So I ask them to look at what they do during a day and say to themselves, what could I do that will make me healthier and make those changes. And for some people going to fast food once a week is just part of their life and that's fine. But if it's something that you do for a meal three times a day, that can affect your blood sugar, your blood pressure, and that might cause risks in pregnancy that you can potentially avoid if you don't do that. And that's true also of if you're overweight, you know, and you're eating a lot of fast food and um, processed food and weight can impact fertility as well. It can. So as we, yeah, I mean, weight can affect fertility. It can increase inflammation in the body. It can affect how we ovulate, the quality of our ovulations, the amount of progesterone that our body makes after ovulation, all of these things, we want them to be as normal as possible so that people get pregnant as easily as possible. And then the biggest risk with obesity is preeclampsia. So that's a high blood pressure, very dangerous condition in pregnancy. And one of the risk factors that cause it, causes it at the highest rate is being overweight. 
before you get pregnant. Too. Yeah. So we want to get as healthy as possible. We want to get our bodies into tip top baby making shape before sperm ever meets the egg, if possible. Yeah. And then you know, continue those good healthy habits after you conceive. What about caffeine? So yeah. it's just too much if you're trying to conceive. Do you need to cut back? Um, you really don't. I mean, what I tell people is that if you're drinking an excessive amount, something's wrong with your lifestyle, right? But if you're doing, if you're drinking like two, three cups a day and that's normal for you, that's okay. And then once you're pregnant, maybe cut down to one to two. And the reason is this, one of the biggest complaints that pregnant women have is insomnia. They have a hard time getting to sleep. And even for some, just the amount of caffeine in a decaf cup can affect their sleep. Even a piece of chocolate, the caffeine and chocolate can do that. So that's why I tell patients, limit your caffeine intake so you can sleep at night. But the first trimester, for example, is when most women are the most tired. They have a hard time opening their eyes. They want to nap all day, but they still want to go to work and function as much as they possibly can. So a cup of coffee a day is not going to harm your pregnancy at all. Yeah, no, for sure. And and you can continue that while you're breastfeeding as well, that one to two cups. Really, if you're if you've got an excessive habit of caffeine, it's probably due to a stressful lifestyle, as you said, and stress can impact fertility. So it's kind of like you're not sure whether it's the, too much coffee or too much stress or a combination of those two. Right. Um, so yeah, cut back on the stress and maybe cut back somewhat on the coffee. What about right. drinking? Um, I did happen to get pregnant and didn't realize it. So I had been, we just got married. We were celebrating a lot. Yeah. Maybe I had a few drinks on a few occasions. Um, but does, does drinking impact your fertility or, or can you wait until you conceive to quit drinking? Yeah. When it comes to drinking, it's complicated. And the reason why it's complicated is one drink for one person can mean something different mm -hmm. as one drink for another person. So if someone's healthy, they're running daily, they're eating healthy. One drink is actually probably totally okay for them. But if someone is overweight, dealing with diabetes and high blood pressure, drinking can actually really harm them. It could make their blood pressure higher. So I look at the whole person when I make that recommendation. So I tell patients, Light drinking is fine when you're trying to conceive, unless of course you have some of these other issues that we really need to make sure are under control. And then I also tell patients, you know, avoid drinking at a time in your cycle when you think you could be pregnant. Right. Right. And so I know in some countries in European countries, for example, you know, drinking is not frowned upon in pregnancy, but I say that there's at no time in pregnancy is drinking permitted or allowed. And the science behind that is, is, is not as clear because some drinking might not hurt one pregnancy, but again, every pregnant woman's different. Her genetics are different. Her baby's genetics are different. So it's always best to just abstain in pregnancy. Yeah. And the sizes of the drinks, as you said, and, you know, one glass of wine, well, have you ever seen some of those glasses that they serve <laughs> wine in, in restaurants? They could be like 18, 22 ounces. So right. that's why it's best to play it safe and, and yeah. And for some people, um, Heidi, for some people, yeah. when you tell them like, just have one drink, they can't. Right. So one yeah. turns into two or three. And for some people, when they drink one glass of wine, then they start eating the processed foods, yeah. the chips and the snacks that they should probably avoid. Yeah. And, but, but if you, if you're celebrating an occasion and you're feeling like yeah. this is a good time to get frisky, then uh, a lot of a lot of couples actually get pregnant when they go on vacation and yeah. they can actually relax and stop yeah. trying. So there's a little connection there. What about weed or edibles? Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, a lot of the community yeah, when I indulge. Talk, yeah. When I talk to people about weed or edibles, I say this, I know you have friends who, you know, smoke weed, they take edibles and they get pregnant. But for my patient population, they're struggling to conceive, right? And so I tell them, please avoid weed and edibles. The amount and exposure of weed and edibles to a man and their sperm, I think does influence the sperm quality. So for example, if someone is smoking all day long, his sperm is going to be more affected than someone who's maybe doing it three or four 
times a week. So I tell people, look, let's see how much you're doing it and let's see what we can do to cut it down if you can't stop completely. And then for women, I tell women to also stop at least two to three months before treatment if possible. Um, but you know, I know some people need weed because of let's say anxiety, pain disorders, sleeping disorders. So I think it's just important to talk to your doctor about your particular situation as you're trying to then see what you can do differently before you get pregnant. So when you get pregnant, you have a plan in place to replace the weed with something else. That's great advice. Um, and what about supplements that you should take and supplements that you shouldn't take? Because a lot of Americans are supplement crazy and you, you're trying to get pregnant. You go you go straight to your store and, and start looking, browsing the aisles for supplements that help with fertility. Is that something you should do? Are there recommendations that every mom should follow? Yeah. I mean, I recommend a really good prenatal at least three months before you're trying to conceive a prenatal with folic acid. So that's really important. If let's say you have a family history or a personal history, I should say of a baby with a neural tube defect, which is a problem with the spinal cord development, or you have a history of a baby with a um, heart defect, you might be re required or asked to take even more folic acid. If you're someone who had a previous pregnancy with preeclampsia, then you might want to take aspirin, um, you know, not necessarily before trying, but definitely once you're pregnant to prevent <laughs> preeclampsia, but yeah, a really good prenatal. And then for fertility, I tell my patients to take CoQ10. There's also another supplement mm -hmm. called uh, true niogen. Uh, the active ingredient is nicotinamide riboside, and this can help with the mitochondria in our cells as well, just like CoQ10. And then depending on whether a patient has endometriosis or PCOS, I ask patients to take other supplements like Ovacetol, for example. So I customize my supplement recommendations for my patients based on what they're going through. But for the most part, you know, vitamin D, fish oil, prenatal CoQ10, I think this, these are things that everyone can take. And you might have a prenatal that already has vitamin D and fish oil, so you don't have to take them separately. Right. But some moms, do you believe that uh, couples should get tested, women should get tested uh, for their vitamin D levels when they're trying to conceive? I do. Um, I have, you know, so many what? different fun ways of thinking about testing. I have the tushy method and the balls method and the tushy method are the five things you do before trying to conceive. And um, it's not for everyone, but if you're interested and the H are basically some of your hormone levels and that includes doing preconception labs and that includes vitamin D. So vitamin D deficiency has been associated with uh, a higher risk of autism, a higher risk of infertility, so th th those are two of the most important reasons for me to check a patient's vitamin D. Vitamin D is also linked to having a lower AMH. So that's the hormone that our ovaries make. Um, uh, and it's a sign of how many eggs someone has. So if your vitamin D is low, your AMH might be a little bit lower. And if your vitamin D goes up, then your AMH goes up. So you can see that there might be a direct link between vitamin D and egg quality for some people. And lots of us are D deficient because we wear sunscreen. We're yeah. really conscious about, you know, skin damage and skin cancer. Um, and we don't have a lot of unprotected sun exposure. Okay. Um, and, and, and it's really hard to get enough vitamin D from your diet. So that's why I'm, I'm a big fan, but of course, talk to your, your, um, your provider about what supplements you should take. Right. And, and in terms of the prenatal, I think it's important to point out that there's no downside to taking a prenatal during your entire reproductive life. Like you never know when pregnancy is gonna sneak up on you. And you know, the downside is only you have better skin and hair and nails, right? That's right, absolutely. And you can actually have your male partner take a prenatal as well. Yeah. So it's just basically a multivitamin that probably gets that pink tax, right? It just says prenatal on it. So we have to pay more for it, but having guys take a male prenatal supplement, yes. um, it doesn't have to be yours there. They do make male prenatals as well. And, and getting enough folate is important. Folic acid is important for them as well. Um, is it true that expectorants can help you expect faster? So your Robitussin, your uh, Mucinex. No, I don't think so. Um, you know, no. there, there are some, there are some medications out there that can 
cause issues with the cervical mucus. There are some treatments, for example, when you're a fertility patient that can cause an, sometimes an accumulation of fluid inside the cavity. Those are the times where I'll tell a patient to take mucinex, for example, but including an expectorant like mucinex or robitussin in your baby making regimen isn't going to increase your chances of getting pregnant. Good to know. And what about orgasm? I mean, I'm all for it. I love a good orgasm, but a lot of women have um, trouble climaxing regularly and, and maybe they worry that, you know, and the more they stress about it, the less likely they are to climax. And, and is that important when you're trying to conceive? Does that boost your odds of conceiving? Um, that's also something that we don't know the answer completely to. So if you look at studies, some studies will say orgasm does increase chances of conception and others say no. So I think the answer is it does not, it does not increase mm -hmm. your chances of conception. The theory is that the contractions that your uterus has with an orgasm will allow sperm to travel to the egg faster and more efficiently. But I don't actually know that we, we know that that's 100% true. So that goes along the lines of what we spoke about earlier. The more you're enjoying sex, then yeah, the higher yes. chance potentially you have because the sperm could be better. But the thing is you can still enjoy sex and not have an orgasm. So don't put pressure on the big O. Don't make that the goal. Make the, the goal, goal the other orgasm because obviously a guy has to orgasm yeah. to ejaculate yeah. sperm yeah. and whatever you guys can do to enjoy yourself during that time, do it. Yeah, but that actually can put a little bit of pressure on him as well. So that's why getting right. into the mood uh, is really important rather than making him feel performance anxiety. What about acupuncture and other complementary and alternative, alternative um, therapies? Do you feel yeah. that they have fertility? You know, I think acupuncture can help decrease your stress. It might help you sleep better. That might help you enjoy life more. And that might in turn improve your fertility. But there are people who do it and they don't enjoy it. They don't like it. It's actually too stressful for them to think about having to do something that they don't enjoy. So what right. I tell my patients is try acupuncture and see how you like it. If you look forward to that appointment, keep going. But if you're like, right. I don't like this, I'm dreading it. Please skip acupuncture and find other ways of bringing joy into your daily life. And maybe try some meditation, self-hypnosis, that kind of stuff. To help meditation, you relax. massage, getting your nails done, scalp massages. There's so many different ways of relaxing. Long walks on the beach. Yes. Let's get romantic. So let's talk about sperm. Um, what can your partner do from his end, so to speak, to uh, boost his sperm quality and quantity? We'll start with the age old question, boxers or briefs? Yeah, you wanna keep your guys nice and cool. You don't wanna cook your balls. So if your guys or your balls- so are meatballs. Yeah, if they're running hot, then I would say do what you can to cool them down. There actually is a company called Snowballs and they actually make underwear that has an ice pack <laughs> insert that you can place in your underwear. So I don't know that you really need to go to that extent, but you know, um, I have patients who are truck drivers, long haul drivers, and it gets really hot in the truck. And so snowballs might be something for them or firemen, for example, they're in their heavy gear. It's really hot, especially in the summertime fighting those wildfires, something like that might be useful for them. But overall, yes, I would say maybe boxer briefs, but if you find that you're running hot, then maybe switch up your underwear too. But the easiest way to know if this is something you should be doing is get your swimmers checked. And there's so many easy ways of doing it. If you go to my website, you can click on shop and there's a link to a test called the fellow kit and you can order it. They'll deliver it to your home. You follow the instructions, you ship it back and you'll get your results within about five days. And then you'll know what kind of changes you need to make to your regimen, basically to get your swimmers to sparkle. <laughs> and so they go... The same goes for hot tub saunas. Absolutely. It's hot laptops. tub saunas, bubble baths, laptops. I mean, my computer gets hot. So if that was on a guy's yeah. lap, I imagine his sperm count would drop. So a laptop on your desk is fine. Oh, laptop on your desk is fine. It's just sitting directly on your lap and the heat 
exposure Absolutely. can be really high. Yeah, absolutely. What about working out? Um, is it good for guys to work out before having baby dancing sex? Is it better not to? No, I mean, I think exercise is great. It can um, improve your mood. It can decrease stress. It can increase your testosterone. So I think having a workout regimen that is healthy and um, and not going to hurt fertility is important. Things that I look out for are guys who are cyclists. So guys who are riding a bike, for example, two, three hours a day, again, we're talking about that heat exposure to the groin that can affect sperm. But for the most part, um, exercise is healthy for sperm as well as eggs. Is there too much, uh, such a thing as too much of a good thing, too much exercise? I mean, th there could be, I uh, mean, if you're, yeah, I mean, if you're an ultra marathoner, for example, and then, you know, doing an Ironman in Hawaii and your, you know, your heat exposure is going to be so high, then that could be detrimental. So sometimes, for example, when I'm planning treatments for people who are ultra marathoners or elite athletes, I'll plan treatments around times, you know, I'll look at when their races are and then we'll plan things after that. Is it true that certain foods can make sperm swim faster? What about <laughs> caffeine? I mean, if you look at the studies, looking at caffeine, the studies actually show one of the most recent ones that I've looked at not that long ago that actually it might improve motility. It doesn't mean that you should start drinking coffee, but I think sometimes I've seen conversations or actually arguments where the woman will say to the man, you need to stop your coffee because it's hurting the sperm. Right, this right. is why we can't get pregnant. But the yeah. reality is, Caffeine does not hurt the swimmers. It does not slow them down. May help them swim faster. Might. Yeah. Are there are there any supplements that guys should stay away from? We know weed definitely um, cut back on that, especially um, you know there's there's the chance that you can make slacker sperm that right way, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, drunk sperm, we don't want binge drinking sperm. We don't want them to be, you know, binge drinking on the weekends. They won't be able to swim straight when that happens. But for guys, sometimes they go online and they, they think, okay, not getting pregnant. Then they think low testosterone. Then they find supplements that can boost testosterone. And these supplements can actually increase a man's testosterone and then decrease the sperm count. So DHEA, for example, is a supplement a man can find at any uh, vitamin shop or store, and that can potentially harm sperm because if your testosterone goes up, if you're taking something that increases your testosterone, the body then says, oh, I don't need to make as much sperm because there's testosterone in my body. So that's one of the supplements that a guy should probably avoid. Okay. And always check with your provider as well. I like for guys to get a preconception consult too, right. to discuss any medication they're taking, any supplements they're taking, um, just like a, a hopeful mom would do. Yeah. Um, so we have a few more questions on this. I have to ask. So does watching a sexy movie help uh, give sperm a boost? I, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think what you're saying, if, you know, if I don't, if a couple means that, then it might, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to prescribe, you know, watch a sexy movie, because it's going to increase your chances. But I mean, it I could help you. Yeah, if you need a sexy movie to get in the mood that night or one day, that's fine. But I don't know that it's going to increase sperm count. Okay. At-home insemination kits um, are a first uh, step if you're a great first step if you're trying to get pregnant solo or if you're two hopeful moms trying to make a baby. But let's say you're a heterosexual couple trying to um, give TTC your best shot. Yeah. Do you recommend I mean, using these kits? I do. So my favorite is the Mosey, M-O-S-I-E baby kit. They have some of the most accurate information on their blog. They have great articles and resources. I might have been, uh, you know, editing some of these articles, making sure that they're perfect and they have always been. So they have a lot of in information on their site and I think their kit is great. The um, the smooth cap on their syringe is also really user-friendly as well as the semen collection cup. So if you combine that with the tests and the uh, prove kits, the confirm and predict, or I always say that wrong, predict and confirm, then 
you know, this might help those couples who, if a woman has painful sex, if it's harder for a guy to, um, you know, get in the mood on demand, um, sometimes doing mm -hmm. it in a cup, while it's not the sexiest thing, sometimes you just got to get it done. If two people are really right. stressed out and they still want to have a baby, they should also not have the stress of, you know, making love. If they're feeling like they just want to make a baby and they're too stressed about the love making part, that's okay. So I actually prescribe these kits to some of my patients who are just starting on their journey or while they're on their journey in between treatments, if they, if they need it. So there's no shame in, in, you know, taking this in your own hands and doing it at home. And all you do is collect a sample, put it in the cup, put it in your bosom, wait about 15, 20 minutes, that gel will turn into liquid and you use the syringe. There's no needle attached. You draw it up and you place it in your vagina, just like a tampon, lie down 10 minutes mm -hmm. and you're done. And hopefully baby bingo. Yes. Um, baby so bingo. yeah. How, okay. This is a really important question um that we we get a lot for sure it's possible to get pregnant without even trying right or the first time that you try you know unprotected sex but oh, how yeah. long does it take the average couple to conceive most people will get pregnant within the first six ovulatory cycles so first six months for most people there are people who don't have regular cycles and are not ovulating regularly. Those people should go right to their doctor when they're ready to try to conceive to figure out why they're not ovulating. And maybe even before to make sure you're not missing a, a very important diagnosis. If after six months, you know, some people say, well, try another six months, but I would say, go, go, go see someone, especially if you're over 35, I would not wait past six months. And just like you said, uh, earlier, hopeful dads should go talk to a doctor. I think hopeful moms should also get some fertility tests run before they start trying to make sure that they shouldn't go right to the fertility doctor or do something before they try. So for example, if you have really heavy periods and you don't know why, and you get pregnant, it turns out you have big fibroids and then you end up miscarrying. You might've wished you had known you had the big fibroids first so that you would have had an opportunity to remove them before you, uh, before you got pregnant. Absolutely. Um, so I have some other questions that just came in. Can you start trying immediately after a chemical pre pregnancy? So a chemical pregnancy, you want to define that first and then. Yeah. So a chemical and pregnancy. Yeah. A chemical pregnancy is when you find out you're pregnant and this hormone called HCG is secreted by the pregnancy for a very small period of time. You're not seeing a clinical pregnancy inside the uterus. There's no sac. A chemical could be either uh, an ectopic pregnancy. So a pregnancy that didn't quite make it down the tube into the uterus, or it can also be a non-viable pregnancy inside the uterus. You don't really know. About 15, some people say even 20 to 30% of uh, pregnancy loss are chemicals and they're very, very common. So a lot of people have them and just don't even know. But if you know you're having a, if you know you've had a biochemical, I would personally, this is just my bias is Talk to a doctor and just make sure you're not missing anything. Look at your egg quality, do some genetic testing, look at the walls of your uterus, look at your fallopian tubes. That's my Tushy method right there for you. For people who don't know what that is, you can go to tushymethod.com and read more about it. But in general, I tell patients, you can go right, assuming like we've done all those tests and everything looks good, there's no wait time. You can try and get pregnant mm -hmm. with your next ovulation uh, without worrying that you're at higher risk of having another biochemical. Most of the time after one biochemical, your next pregnancy still has just as high of a chance of being healthy as, as for someone who did not have that biochemical. And the same thing if you've had a miscarriage, correct? Yeah. yeah. So if you've a had a miscarriage, miscarriage, yeah, I've had patients, I hear their well-intentioned OBGYN saying things like you need to wait six months before you can try again, or three months before you can try again. The reality is if you feel emotionally ready and physically and emotionally healed, you can try with your next ovulation. So there's no medical reason to wait. Um, I like to run tests on my patients after a miscarriage because I like to prevent recurrent pregnancy loss. Other doctors like to, and, and I, I use the word like loosely, it's not like they like to wait for a patient to have this, but they usually say things like, we have to wait for you to have three miscarriages before we'll do any tests. But 
that's not mm -hmm. how I provide care for patients who've had miscarriage. Cause I want to see if there's anything we should learn before the next one, before the next pregnancy. And hopefully it won't miscarry. Most of the time, most people don't have recurrent pregnancy loss, but a good, a good enough percentage of women do. And that's why I do these kinds of tests. That's great because it's really hard advice to get, you know, that, you know, you have to wait three miscarriages in order to oh, get yeah. some help. Incredibly cruel. Yeah. Um, how many days is it normal to have egg white cervical mucus? Not the one from the fridge that you were right. talking yeah. about. Yeah. But how about long should you have? I remember doing the stretching exercises when yeah. he was ovulating and yeah. getting cervical mucus to a point where it could stretch. Yeah. Um, so about, about three days before ovulation is when you start noticing the egg white cervical mucus. And then your discharge usually can change after ovulation too, as your estrogen rises and your progesterone rises. And then again, before you know, your period starts. So um, that's what you should look out for. That's one of those signs of ovulation. When you start seeing that egg white cervical mucus, you know, ovulation is imminent. If you don't feel the egg white cervical mucus, it doesn't mean it's not there. So I have patients that they really analyze these things and it causes them great concern when they don't see en enough of it. And, and I reassure them that your body's doing exactly what she was supposed to do. Just let her be, don't overanalyze it. It's, it's like losing your mucus plug. Some people don't even right. notice it when they lose it. And right. some people, yeah, they send me pictures on Instagram message. Right. So yeah, right. it, it's as long as your body's doing what it needs to do, that's the important part. You don't have to overanalyze your bodily fluids. Um, but she did ask how to naturally, how can you naturally increase the mucus? Is it um, yeah, so there's, um, so there are natural ways um, I don't know how effective they are, but you might want to try them. So seed cycling is something that I've had patients do, um, funk it. I think that's the name of the company. I hope I'm saying it right, but seed cycling is literally the use of seeds at different intervals in your cycle to help improve your body's natural ovulation, help support progesterone as well. So that might be something that can help. But basically if, if you're, if you're not having good quality ovulations, it could be a sign of a condition like PCOS. And so there are mm -hmm. things that we can do to augment someone's ovulation to increase the, you know, basically the, the chance that you're ovulating and that will increase your cervical mucus as well. Okay. So when should you consider seeking help if you're not getting pregnant? So if you're over 35, you should get help after... Yeah. I mean, after six months of trying, but I really think everyone should get their tushy checked and their balls checked from the very beginning. Right. So just get some hormone levels checked, do a pelvic ultrasound. If you have risk of tubal blockage, like a history of chlamydia, get your tubes checked, right. Get the sperm checked up front, um, do some genetic tests, make sure that you and the sperm provider are genetically compatible and don't share the same genes for diseases like cystic fibrosis, for example, these are all things an OBGYN can do or a local fertility doctor. You don't have to see the local fertility doctor, but you also don't need to get a referral from your OBGYN to do these tests. You can go straight to the local fertility doctor to do them. Okay. Um, what about, uh, keeping mom cool is hot yoga. We know that during pregnancy, you shouldn't do hot yoga. Um, you shouldn't get overheated. You should stay out of hot tubs, but what about when you're TTC? Yeah. When you're trying to conceive, I highly recommend that if a patient is doing high impact, high intensity exercise, and this is just part of her life, she can continue it, but use your common sense. Just use it. I mean, if your BMI is 17 and you're working out three hours a day, that's going to hurt your fertility. But if you have a healthy BMI and being fit and active is something that you enjoy, it's not time to become and turn into a couch potato when you're trying to conceive. That can just, if you tell someone that who's used to being active, it can make them really anxious and sad. And, and it's, I, it's not good for pregnancy either. Right. You, you want to be, be active. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, I, and I've seen also dynamics with couples where the husband is saying to the wife, like, why are you moving around? You should just be in bed all day. And it's like, no, you don't want to have muscle atrophy. Mm -hmm. Totally. I think no, ACOG, mm -hmm. ACOG recommend it. 
recommendations are for 30 minutes minimum of exercise. Uh, yeah, 150 minutes. So, yeah, exactly. About approximately 150 minutes per week. Um, and that includes for my patients, I just say, just don't lift over 40 pounds. Um, and that's in pregnancy. And then always like, just use your common sense. If you're not feeling well, if you're feeling dizzy, just take it easy. But overheating is not a concern. It's a concern for guys who are TTC, but not not for women who are teenagers. Yeah, you can't, our eggs, our ovaries are nice and warm inside our bodies, mm -hmm. right? And so hot yoga is not going to hurt our eggs. It's not going to cause the egg count to decline. So um, hot yoga is safe for patients who are trying to conceive. It just it also depends like what treatment you're doing, what time you are in your cycle. So again, like I don't want my patients to become really dehydrated as they're going through IVF, for example, because I want them to be hydrated as their ovaries are swelling. So they have a better recovery. So there are times where it's more appropriate than others. Okay. So now it's time to take that all important test, the pregnancy test, the home mm -hmm. pregnancy test. There's no need to study, but you do have some tips for testing, right? Like what's the earliest? So the earliest yeah. I tell patients to test is 12 days post peak, 12. I know there are tests out there that you can start checking at nine. And I know there are people that probably start checking. I know they do like the day after they've ovulated. Yeah. And then they like have oh, index cards and they have like seven tests a day. And they're like looking at the lines. All yeah. I mean, that can make a sane person insane. Okay. So I just tell people pee, then flush. That's it. And then 12 days after your peak, then test. And then having a faint line is normal. You know, people say the test is negative. The line's faint. And so I'm like, no, the test is positive. The line's faint. That's great. And then I do blood draws. I check serum levels and then I watch them rise over time because my patients are going through a lot and have been through right. a lot to get to this point. So I do more monitoring than uh, the general population needs. But once you have a positive pregnancy test, I would ask your OBGYN to then schedule your first OB appointment for you. I do my first uh, ultrasounds at six and a half weeks of pregnancy. And that's when you can see the heartbeat for the first time, because I want to confirm the pregnancy is in the right place and of the uterus and healthy. Yeah. And, and it makes it easier to date the pregnancy more accurately if you don't know the day that you conceive. Mm -hmm. So early ultrasounds are important. The problem is getting in for an appointment. So right. call early and often. Um, yeah. what, what about if you have a negative test? Should you yeah. test again and again? Um, and again? Yeah. If you have a negative test 12 days post peak, mm -hmm. then I tell patients it is most likely negative. But of course, everyone wants to be that one person where they have the negative test and then it became positive, right? So what I tell people is if your period hasn't started within three or four days after this negative test, then retest, right? Because your period should start if you're not pregnant, but if it hasn't, then test again. Right. And I think it, it can be really, especially when you've been trying for a while and you feel all of those symptoms maybe you've psyched yourself into feeling the symptoms or maybe they just so closely mimic the feelings of PMS of getting your period. Um, yeah. and, and that can be, that can be really, I, I can't tell you how, how many moms message me and say, Oh, I feel pregnant. I feel pregnant. You know, is it possible? Um, so, and then I'm going to ask you, is it true that some women feel pregnant before they test pregnant? Yeah. So, I mean, um, feeling like you're pregnant and not being pregnant has a lot to do with the hormones that our ovaries make, but also the first sign of pregnancy is actually lower abdominal cramping. So mm -hmm. the people who knew they were pregnant before they were pregnant, they, they can sense that sometimes they'll feel also fuller breasts, for example, yeah. their sense of smell changes, the smell of their urine changes. They might feel just some slight dizziness maybe their heart rate will go up a little bit. So those are the subtle changes that some people can sense if they know to look for them before they even do their first pregnancy test. And these can be signs that they're pregnant already. Or it could also be a sign that you're getting your period. So some of those symptoms. Um, yeah, yeah, awesome. for sure. But for the people who find out they're pregnant, those are some of the signs sometimes they describe for sure. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, and I wanted to ask you, is there a better time 
back in the olden days, um, you used to take a pregnancy test first thing in the morning. Um, can you take a pregnancy test any time of the day? Any time of day. So if a patient, she's like, when can I take the pregnancy test? It's been 14 days. I say, take one now. They're like, oh, okay, I'll wait till tomorrow morning. Cause it's 6 PM. I'm like, no, no, take one now. Right. So yeah. you can take a pregnancy test any time of day earlier on in pregnancy. You know, when you're looking at like 12 days post ovulation, if your urine is really diluted from hydrating well all day long, that HCG might not get picked up because it's too dilute. But if you're waking up first thing in the morning, that pee, that's going to be the, you know, that's give you the concentration. Concentration. Yeah, it's more concentrated. Yeah. So that works great, but you can still take it at 3 p.m. So I've got some specific questions about assisted reproduction options. Um, when you say that, when you say get your tubes checked, is that an HSG procedure or is there another easier way to check? Yeah. So I do something called Hycosi with XM foam. It's a procedure done in my office and it's a special gel that I infuse into the cavity of the uterus and into the tubes. It's basically painless compared to the HSG, which is extremely painful. There are some people who don't have access to the Hycosi with XM foam. So I will tell them to get an HSG, the histocellpingogram using x-ray, but I'll have them take pain meds like Tylenol with codeine and Valium 30 minutes before and antibiotics as well. So I don't believe in causing any woman pain, especially a woman who wants to have a baby. So I try and make sure if I'm ordering something like that, the patients are gonna be comfortable. That's great. And fibroids and endometriosis. Um, oh, this woman is actually having that removed next week. Are her chances of conceiving going to be quite a bit higher after? Yeah, it depends on the uh, yeah, it depends on the size and location. So anytime a woman has surgery, I always say get your AMH level checked. So AMH is the hormone that tells us how many eggs you have. Because what you might want to do if your AMH is low is rather than having surgery done and waiting six months for healing, you might want to preserve eggs and embryos depending on your age, so that when you're done with healing, you would have had gotten a head start on your fertility journey. So um so the, the, the short answer is most likely your, your fertility will improve, but also depends on your age and what your fertility status is right now. Okay. And we're running out of time. So I just wanted to see if you have any other tips for hopeful uh, parents. Yeah. So some journey. Might, oh, absolutely. I mean, um, for hopeful parents, I mean, I don't want anyone to have to see me ever. Right. Um, so I really want everyone I to get it. I know, but I, I want people to get, I love you. Thank you. Heidi. I just want people to get pregnant without my help. So I would say, you know, if you probably the, the most important thing for me is for people to have healthy relationships with themselves and their partners. And I want, you know, if I had my way, which is what I think you would have too, is as soon as someone says, I want to have a baby, we just take care of her. We feed her with healthy food. We you know we give her, not feed her, you know, here's spoon food, but she gets healthy foods. She gets support around the first trimester. So that's, that's my hope for um, hopeful parents is make sure that your relationship with yourself is good. Your relationship with your partner is good. I, I don't like to see families get split up through divorce. It makes me very sad. Um, so whatever you can do to, to make sure everything is good before you bring a baby into this world is, is what I would do. And then make sure that your relationship with your doctor is good, that you've reviewed your medications with them, that you're not on an unsafe antihypertensive, or, you know, you, you want to make sure that you are taking your blood pressure medication before you get pregnant. So, um, so thank you for asking me that question. And even, even things like antidepressants, um, mm -hmm. check with your Provider. Always check with your provider first before weaning yourself off of any medications. Uh, just because you believe the medication is unsafe if you're trying to conceive or if you're pregnant, you might need a change of medications, but it's so important to have those discussions, have that consult, have the testing that you need um, so that you can just get busy and have fun. Exactly. I mean, the only medication you should wean off on your own is birth control. That, Other than that's that, important. Doctor, yes, that's really important. And by the way, um, you can get pregnant uh, soon after that. 
So oh, soon I after people, and, I just yeah, had a mom so message me saying, yeah, saying that she uh, thought it would take a few months for her body to regulate. And she was shocked that she was pregnant right away. So yeah. that happened. Definitely. So thank you so much, Dr. Amy, and mm -hmm. lots of TTC, TTC hugs for everyone. You know, may your baby wishes come true. And for more information, go to dramy.org and connect with Dr. Amy and her social channels linked in the chat. And you can find and my links too there, of course. And also you can check out um, the prequel to what to expect when you're expecting, which is what to expect before you're expecting. So awesome. thanks everybody and big hugs. Thank you, Heidi. Love you. See you guys later. Bye everyone. Bye.